Anyway, we're looking at Sarah today. Now, really, Charlotte Fritz does a great job in her book covering the aspect of waiting in Sarah's life that you think, what can Deborah say for 45 minutes? So I thought we'd look at Ezekiel. No, <laughs> just kidding, man. You'll never see me going to Ezekiel. Um, we're going to look at Sarah as a biography, her whole life, really, what's going on. It's unfortunate that when we mention Sarah, she is remembered for two unsavory chapters in her life. Uh, one of them, of course, is covered in this book, uh, the choice to give Hagar to his, his, her husband slash half-brother slash, you know, whatever. Um, and, and then the choice to the, the laughter. Like I asked a couple of people, what do you think of when you think of Sarah? Um, Hagar and laughing. And so you could also say that she had another chapter that people remember her for two decisions that had far reaching effects, even to this day, where the U.S. is spending money and the U.N. is since giving all their political attention to is the Arabs versus the uh, Jews that we have going on. And it's because, first of all, she gave Hagar to Abraham and she conceived. And interestingly enough, it was Hagar who despised Sarah, rather than Sarah despising Hagar. I, I always thought it was the other way around. Like, why is Hagar despising Sarah? Well, I had plans. I was going to do the great adventure. Now I'm pregnant. It's a very common mindset today that children are an inconvenience. And maybe Hagar had that kind of view, like, oh, this is an inconvenience. Now I'm tied down. Or maybe I, maybe she was in love with somebody else. And now I'm, I'm, I'm a concubine to this guy. She was an Egyptian. Um, you know, so it's not like, so there's just a lot of reasons for Hagar to be a little bit uh, despise Sarah for having conceived. But so Sarah's big mistake was giving Hagar to Abraham. And the second one is that she cast him out. And ever since that moment, she cast Ishmael out. There has been bickering and battling throughout history ever since. You could say that Sarah is as far from the cross as we are today. She is 2,000 years on the other side of the cross while we're 2,000 years this side. And for 4,000 years, Ishmael and Isaac have been going at it. <clears throat> um, but though we might immediately think of, oh yeah, I know who Sarah is. She's the one that did the DIY project and she's the one that laughed in unbelief. <laughs> My Lord, being so old, forget the fact that I haven't had that time of the month for the last 16 years. But, you know, she's always saying, My Lord, being so old kind of a thing. Um, the New Testament mentions her four times and mentions her very heroically, favorably holds her up for us as a role model in different areas, uses her as an allegory of the grand and glorious new covenant. Anyone who is free, anyone who has been liberated by Christ, he says, Sarah is your mother. You know, like, wow, that's a very favorable. And that's just the way the new covenant goes about its business of looking at our lives. Whereas we see sin, sin throughout, like, huh, I, you know, you might have one flaw in your life, and I'm like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, uh, Sherry the liar. Why? Well, because I told you, she told me she was going to be there at 1230, and she showed up at 1235. <laughs> the liar. Ever after, the liar. You know, that's how we would view it, but God doesn't do that. Um, we see it in First Peter chapter 4. This is one of the places where Sarah is mentioned. I'll just tell you where they're at. First Peter chapter three. Um, Sarah's held up as a, as specifically to women as a role model. But as Peter goes further down the chapter, he's held up to all of us of what it is to, uh, he broadens out what he did to all of us. And that is to submit ourselves to one another. Women submit to your husbands and, um, and then further and honor your husbands. And then further down, it says submit one to another. So Peter broadens it out and it demonstrates to us. Peter demonstrates to us what God's grace, how, how God's grace can use us even in our weakness. This is how it goes down. Peter, utter failure. We could say that if we were going to define Peter by one act, it would be his denial. I can't believe it. It was just like to a fair young maiden maybe 16-year-old, and there's a veteran fisherman weathered and 
Uh, and he's like, I don't know him. Bleepity bleep bleep bleep. <sighs> that ought to convince him. Like, why was he so scared? What 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 happened there? Utterly failed him, and yet God restores him. But he he's restored, and he as a re result he has a tenderness, so that when he writes his epistle, he's very tender to the Old Testament saints. How does he describe Lot? Lot, you know the one that committed incest with his two daughters. You know the one who was hesitant to obey the angel and flee Sodom. You know the whiny lot that says, that's too far. Do I have to go that far to escape destruction? I, I, I'm tired. He, he's just like, what's up with you, Lot? He gets drunk. He's an, and there's just so many things. And yet, how does Peter describe him? Righteous Lot. And what can we say about righteous Lot? And you're looking through the Old Testament trying to find, where is this guy, righteous Lot? And he says, his, you may not have seen it, but his soul was vexed within him. There are some people who are behaving in such a fashion, you're just like, seriously, are they even saved? But their souls are vexed within them. And Peter says, what can we say about righteous Lot, whose soul was vexed within him? Like, that's very gracious of you, Peter. And he says, I know what it's like to have that need. To someone look at me through that kind of eyes? And then he says, Sarah, he said, he commends Sarah to us in first Peter chapter three. And he says, women, look at Sarah and how she, how she goes, my Lord being so old, look at how she, you know, we, we get the story in Genesis chapter 18. There's these three strangers that come uh, waltzing across their turf and Abraham invites them in and they get to talking and it says, you shall have a son uh, a year hence. And Sarah says to her, I don't know if it says it to them. She's in the tent. She fairly well could be to herself under her breath. <laughs> How can my Lord, being so old, ever have a son? And she laughs in unbelief, mockery, maybe bitterness, maybe hardness. How many times have I heard about this covenant, this promise of a nation? And, and so she's laughing in unbelief and hardness. And uh, so Peter takes that. That phrase, how can my Lord, being so old, conceive? This is ridiculous. And God in heaven says, you know what? This is, there's nothing the angels are saying. That's terrible. There's nothing salvageable out of that. There's nothing worth saving. And God takes out, look at that. She called Abraham Lord. And the angels tap on his shoulders. Yeah, but it's patronizing. She was mocking him. She was complaining about his age. Well, has she considered her womb that was the... Yes, but I think we can save that word. And he puts it in the epistle of Peter, and he says, women, emulate Sarah. And how she called her husband Lord. How she revered and honored her husband with that one phrase. Now, of all the examples of revering your husband, you pick that. <laughs> well, that's all Sarah gave him. I mean, you look in the Old Testament, everything she's saying is negative. And it's like God's looking through the, through the sands of our life and what we've contributed. And he's like, ah, look at this, a needle in the haystack. I can sew something with that. And that's just the eyes of grace. That's what the New Testament does. The way you will, you'll be hard-pressed to find the sin of an Old Testament saint mentioned in the New Testament. The closest you get is Rahab the harlot. But that's her middle and last name. You know, it's just like <laughs> Rahab the harlot. Ruth had that problem too. Ruth the Moabitess. Well... Uh, so New Testament is, is very gracious to it. So you have that in, in 1 Peter chapter 3. You also have her mentioned in Romans 9.9, 9, where it, she's basically demonstrating for us the sovereignty of God in selecting. It is always, we, we don't, shouldn't get bogged down on this idea of God electing or selecting. He selects us. All of, the, in all of Genesis is about God choosing this family, God choosing that person, God choosing this nation to be a witness. He chooses the church to be a witness to the world. And back in the day, he's choosing Sarah. She played a very pivotal position. And it's not necessarily chosen to salvation, like he chooses who gets saved and he chooses who goes to hell. It's not, what he was doing in the Old Testament is he choosing people for a role. And he says, I choose Sarah for a role to be the mother of us all. It's always supposed to be the firstborn. 
you know, but the, lo and behold, you got the Cain and Abel issue, and Abel was preferred. And then it became Cain and, and um, Seth, and then Seth gets preferred. Japheth is the older, and lo and behold, Shem is getting picked. And Jacob and Esau. Uh, Jacob was not the firstborn. Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac was not the firstborn. So over and over again, it's like God is breaking the rules. God is picking the underdog. He's always going against Tom Brady. Wait. No. He's not with the Patriots anymore. He, and so he's, um, he's always picking the underdog, the misfits, the one who's not everyone else has written off. Oh, he's the second born. Oh, he's defective. Oh, J David's the eighth born. And yet that's the one who's chosen. So over and over again, he, and, and who does he choose to be the mother of us all? Ah, there's Rahab the harlot, Ruth the Moabitess, Sarah the barren. That was her name. How, are, how is she introduced to us? We look at it in Genesis 11. Verse 30, it says, Abraham had a wife. Name was Sarah. Sarah was barren. Sarah had no child. You know, like, how many times do you have to mention this? Huh? You know, why don't you just stab the knife in me, turn it a couple of times, and I get it. I cannot conceive. What more do you want to say? Oh, that you had no child. The Holy Spirit's doing that. Well, I think what the Holy Spirit's trying to get across is that we're talking about bona fide, real, live barrenness. This isn't like, oh, it's not her time. Nope, she has no child. As a matter of fact, when, and, and it's like that throughout. So she's, she's introduced that way in 11 and 30. And then chapters 13 and 14 and 15, she's not mentioned at all. So there's like a three-chapter hiatus about the story of Sarah's life. You get to chapter 16, like, oh, yeah, you remember Sarah who we mentioned back in chapter 12? She's barren. <laughs> I mean, it's like, the, it's like the first verse of 16. It's like, we haven't forgotten the facts. You know? <laughs> so she has that same problem with the middle and the last name, Sarah the Baron. <laughs> uh, so. Anyway, um, we were on Romans 9, 9. Oh, yeah, so how God is choosing always the underdog, the misfit. And so God chooses Sarah, the barren, who had no child, who could not conceive to be the mother of all the faithful. He's constantly doing that. And so we may think we're disqualified because we don't have good characteristics. And we've done this. We've been divorced. And we've made that mistake. And we've chosen this errant way. Well, God can get us not only back on the trail like he did Peter, but actually use us uh, in a very significant way like he did Peter. So that's Romans 9. A little bit of God's election goes on there, and it's an election to a role. He elected Israel to a role that they were supposed to be um, – dispensing the good news of the gospel to people, the, dispensing the goodness of Yahweh to people. So that as people are walking by this main thoroughfare called the land of Israel, going from Europe to Asia and to Africa, that they would meet up with these Jews and they would taste the fruit of their life and they would say, this is good fruit. Where did you get this from? And they would, be, they would get to say, it's from heaven. Our roots are in heaven. Israel was called the vine of God. Three images used of Israel in the Old Testament. Fig tree, olive, and the vine. Isaiah 5 says they were the vine. And so people were walking by Israel. They were riding by Israel. They taste the fruit now. <coughs> what is that stuff? It was having a very negative image of who God was. So finally, Jesus Christ comes and he says, I am the true vine. And that's what he's saying. I am the replacement of Israel, you might say, the fulfillment of Israel. So that when people taste him, I, wow, where did you get this stuff? This is better than Michigan apples. Where? And we could say <laughs> our roots are in Christ. And that's why it, to us, we get to have that same experience, that we'd be so sweet to the taste that people would say, why are you so different? How come you're giving parking spaces away? How come you didn't fight me for this last roll of toilet paper? You say, because my roots are in Christ. Um, so Romans 9, she was elected to a role, the role of the mother of us all. Israel was elected to a role, and they thought 
God's message was, I will bless you, O Israel. Instead, the real message was, I will bless others through you, O Israel. But they, they got it confused. They got the message confused. Instead of being a blessing through Israel, they're just like, bring it on, God. I will take it all. And, and um, anyway, getting distracted. Romans 9 is one of the places where Sarah is mentioned heroically as an example of God's election. First Peter, as a role model, not only to women, but to all of us, as Peter broadens it, demonstrating the grace of God, how he's able to use us even in our weakness. He's also mentioned in Galatians, Galatians chapter 4. This is, this is a hard one. I don't understand it, so we're not actually going to get answers tonight, but it is just a mention that she is used, Sarah is used as an allegory of the New Testament, of the New Covenant. Paul, when you read Galatians, you're talking about this distinction between law and grace, law and gospel, works and faith. Um, and, in, and, and in that same distinction, you have Hagar and Sarah. Sarah kicks Hagar out of the party. So Abraham throws this big party for Isaac after he's weaned. And uh, Sarah's like, get rid of that woman, it says in Genesis 21.10. Get rid of her. I don't want her to have any part of my son's inheritance. And this, and at that point, Abraham's like, golly, that just doesn't seem like a good idea. I don't know, Sarah. And then God taps him on the shoulder and says, yeah, you, need, you do need to get rid of him. It, you, this is the promised child, and Ishmael will have his own nation. He'll have his own, but this, pay heed to Sarah. Abraham's like, okay. But lo and behold, we see it in Galatians 4.30, um, where Hagar represents for us in this allegory bondage and sin and legalism and Phariseeism. Hagar represents to us the Pharisees. It says like this, um, there's two covenants. If you start in 21... Tell me, you who desire to live under the law, if you desire to live under the law, your whole life is going to have to keep the law. Are you up for that? And he says it's written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a slave, a bondwoman, and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. That represents our first birth. It's natural. That's just the way life is supposed to go. Born according to the flesh. And when we're born the first time, we're born into bondage. We do have this thing called original sin. And he who was born of the free woman, that was a second birth. That was being born again. That was being born through a promise. And so he's representing this as the first birth and the second birth, old covenant, the new covenant, law and grace. These things are symbolic. For there are two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and it corresponds to Jerusalem, which is now in the physical, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above, the free Jerusalem, the city of peace where God reigns, that's the mother of us all. For it is written, rejoice, O barren woman, that would be Sarah. Then it goes on to 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, we are children of promise. We are born of the Spirit. And then he says, Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir of the son of the free woman. This is Sarah. This is what Sarah said when she was like, This is my son's party. He shouldn't be at his bar mitzvah. You know, that's kind of her attitude was. Um, and, and so she kind of does it in sinful way, and yet God uses it as an allegory of what the new covenant is, there will be no bondage. There will be nothing of the flesh. There will be nothing of naturalness in the kingdom of God. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman. We are not children of sin. We are not children of the flesh, but of the free. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free. So it's interesting. Of all the people to use to represent the new covenant, let's pick this Okay, nobody here gave her a grade higher than C. One person even gave her a D. And so it's like, let's use that dropout student as an example of what the great and glorious gospel of the new covenant is. 
Well, it is great and glorious that he can use a C student to be the representative of such a grand thing. What hope is there for us? Great hope. Okay, so that's, um, that's the first part. Just to say this, the three passages, Romans 9, 9, Galatians 4, 30, 1 Peter 3. Oh, yeah, the fourth one, Hebrews 11, 11. Now, an interesting thing was discovered this morning, and that is the NIV translation, 1984. They make it all about Abraham. <laughs> When you read Hebrews 11 and the people that are mentioned in there, you just have to ask yourself, of all the things about Noah and about Joseph and about Jacob and about Abraham, why do they pick the particular incidents to accentuate their faith? And it's usually, do a study on Hebrews 11 and look for, has God asked them to believe in something invisible, something that they've never seen done before? And then he brings it to fruition. Has God asked Noah, who has never seen a drop of rain fall from heaven, to build a boat in preparation for a drop of rain to fall from heaven? He's asking Abraham, he's asking him to leave uh, Ur of the Chaldees and go to a city that he never sees. He doesn't know where he's going. And so throughout Hebrews 11, you'll see that the acts that are accentuated are believe in something that you haven't seen. Will you take God's word for it? even though you've never seen it before. He's making, God makes visible things out of invisible things. The earth was void and empty. There was darkness and the spirit of God was hovering over it. Vastness. Then God said, and visibleness became. So that's what's going on in Hebrews 11. That's the whole thing about the visible and the invisible and all that. By faith, don't read the NIV on this. By faith, Sarah herself received strength. Have you ever had a time in your life where you're discouraged, down in the mouth, nothing is working, all seems hopeless, 35 years waiting for this promise of God. Every month, the cycle comes around and you think, I'm not pregnant, I'm not pregnant. Finally, the cycle dries up altogether. And the scripture says, um, uh, it, it's as good as dead, and all hope is lost. Don't you find it hard when you're in a discouraging time, you're unemployed, and your relationship has broken up, and you're facing financial to receive strength? By faith, Sarah received strength. Can you receive encouragement when you're down in the mouth? Will you accept a little financial help when you're in a crisis of funds? Sometimes it is so hard. We're so independently minded as Americans that we find that difficult to do. We'll do it by faith. Just like by faith, Sarah received strength. Why? Because she did an evaluation of everything God had done. Looking at her life, the things that she'd gone through. She'd given up living in a glorious city there in Iraq. She was an Iraqi, not a Jew, by the way. She was there in Ur the Chaldees, living nice and good, and then she becomes a nomad, never to see a house again. Why? Because God called her. Even though she never did find that city whose maker and builder was God, she's living the nomadic life throughout 2,000 miles in the Fertile Crescent from, from Shechem to Bethel to Gerar to uh, Beersheba and Hebron and Egypt, and they still don't know where home is. Um. But she did, so she gave up. She never lived in a house again from the time they got called. She lived a nomadic lifestyle. Abraham, time of famine, decides, let's go down to Egypt. Abraham comes up with this harebrained idea. Hey, tell them that you're my sister. Because really, you are, you are my sister, after all, in part. And, you know, whenever devil gets you to tell half-truth, he's just <laughs> trying to get the other person to believe the wrong part. So the half-truth business... And so Sarah agrees with this harebrained idea and she's waiting, you know, and why? One thing we know is Sarah's barren. Another thing we know is she's beautiful. So beautiful that Abraham is scared that he'll lose his head so that someone could have her. He knows full well that the womb is barren. And yet even then he's still like, I'm still afraid 
that they'll kill me in order to have access to her. She's so beautiful. And Sarah, of course, like, I know. That's why I'll go along with your plan. I can clearly see it'll cost you your head. And I, you know, modest gal that she is. Um, and she probably said, oh, my Lord, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Again, saying my Lord, though. Um, and she goes and she's waiting. What is going to happen? Here I am in the middle of this harem in a foreign land. I don't have my husband to protect me. I'm on my own. What will Pharaoh do to me? And she's waiting. Abraham's abandoned me. He's unmarried me. He's, he's done with me. I'm on my own. And God intervenes. Not only does he intervene to rescue Sarah, but he intervenes by making them very, very prosperous as they leave Egypt. No more famine for them. Don't you wish you were more creatives, creative in your sin? You know me, I've wrestled with the same sin all my life. You know, like, why couldn't I be like tempted to pickpocket or, or you know, are, are tempted to make a heist like Ocean's Eleven or tempted to speed 101 miles an hour down highway 370 or why can't i do some fun sins uh you know it's always the same uncreative sin and it's the same problem with abraham too 20 years later we see him doing the same exact thing a lot of people think oh it's a it's a copyist error the story of abimelech and the story of pharaoh giving abraham giving sarah to them because she's so beautiful because the story's in there twice you think, oh, it's the same story. Oh, no, no, no. It's not hard to believe you'd do the same thing again. After all, as far as Abraham was concerned, it worked out really well. Not only did I save my skin, but I also came out with a lot of livestock, gold and silver, and a few servants to boot. Um, so anyway, Sarah had to go through a lot. Um, all right, all right. So there she is. He received strength. Abraham was a man of faith. Goes on to say he was a man of faith, strong in faith. Sarah was not so strong. She was a wavering in faith. She laughed in unbelief, like, ha, huh, my Lord being so old, this ain't going to happen. Everything you read in the Old Testament is kind of negative until she finally gets the prized possession of a son. You're like, wow, she's a neg negative nilly. Um, and so, but yet, even in that, uh, that wavering faith that was a little bit weak, she, she received strength. Why? Because God's purposes rested on it. Because Abraham was strong in faith? Because yours and my salvation depended on it? No, that is not why he received strength in this difficult, depressing time. He evaluated God, tallied it all up, and despite all the hardship, he said, he's faithful who promised. There's one thing I do know while I'm in this depressive state. God is faithful. God will provide. God can be counted on. And so it's, it's as simple as that. I mean, it's as simple as that. And it's just to say he might not have had the grand picture of things. We should have an invested interest in Sarah and her biography because it's not just the hope of Israel that rested on her, but all the messianic promises rested in her. Your and my salvation is in this woman's womb. It's, a, it's amazing, the great... Okay, a couple of unique facts about her. She's an Iraqi. Um, she's from the, the confluence there of the Tigris, Euphrates, right near the Persian, or the Chaldees. Um, she's not Jew. Jew doesn't come along until Sarah has Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. And for great-grandsons, she has a bajillion, and one of them is called Judah. And he, that's from whence we get the name Jew. Now, she might be called a Hebrew because that means from on the other side of the river. So Sarah, the Iraqi, who was a Hebrew, you might say that. It's just to say this. God is constantly calling out the underdogs, the misfits, and the unqualified. Um, she's 65 years old. The senior citizens get a call. And at 65 years old, they so start to sojourn where they never, they leave everything that's familiar. They leave their family. They leave everything that they've collected. Oh, my kind of said, oh, my, you know how it is when you're trying to downsize your mother or your father and move them in. You're just like, oh, I can't get rid of that. Well, that's exactly what they were going through. And yet then they moved on to live a nomadic life. Um, she had to live through the difficulty of famine, but even more. Uh, dramatic and more difficult as it proved to be 
if she had to live through prosperity. Yes, it's true. When they came out of Egypt, they received livestock and gold and silver and slaves and everything was prosperous. Um, just as a little tangent here, consider Lot. Lot is with Abraham and Sarah, and he comes with Abraham and Sarah out of Ur of the Chaldees. Abraham's brother was his father, and he died. And so Lot is fatherless, perhaps even motherless from the sounds of it. And so there's this lad without parents. And there's this parent, there's these, this couple without child. And so Abraham and Sarah bring Lot to their bosom and say, you will be as ours. You shall be our son. And so Abraham gets the call. Lot goes with them. Abraham and Sarah want to wrestle with this famine. They decide to go down to Egypt. Lot goes with them. Wherever Abraham and Sarah is, there's Lot. You could probably more accurately say, accurately say wherever Sarah is, there's Lot. Mama's boy. He's like, this is my joy. He is my heart. Well, they come out of Egypt and everybody is prosperous. Got so much. They think it, this was a grand thing, but prosperity isn't always grand. They have all these riches, and all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but gradually, Lot's servant, Lot's ranch hands are getting after Abraham's ranch hands, and they're bickering, and there's not enough grazing ground for all the livestock they have, which is as good as cash. This is the cash system of the day. That's why they know that Job was in the time of Abraham as a patriarch, because that's how they valued their wealth. It was in livestock. And they were going at it. They had so much wealth. There wasn't a bank big enough to hold it. So Abraham says to Lot, and it sounds very magnanimous, and he is to be credited for this, but he says to Lot, you choose whatever area you want, and I'll go the other way. Sounds magnanimous. You separate from us. You go your way, we'll go our way, and we won't have any more bickering. We won't have any more uh, rivalry. It's almost like uh, America today. You just you be the southern part, we'll be the northern part, and we don't have to, everybody can move to whatever side they want. So Abraham picked, he was greatly influenced while he was in Egypt. He, he said, I'll pick the Valley of Sodom because that reminds me of Egypt. And he went, and that's where he ended up taking. And Abraham said, okay, Saranara. And meanwhile, Sarah's looking out the window of the tabernacle, window of the tent, like, that's my heart. That's my son. You guys can't work it out. You can't get, uh, get some new head boss that's going to work out. Can't you just send his sheep and the farmhand over there? Why do you have to send Lot down there? It does look like Egypt, and we know how horrible Egypt is. Why are you sitting? And so her very heart was being separated. I tell you, women are much more relational than men. You know, there's a story in a Reader's Digest about this boyfriend and girlfriend. They're, they're driving down, uh, right, they had went to a movie, had dinner, everything's good, they're on their way home, and the girl kind of gushes, you, do you know, it's been six months since we started dating. And there's like this pained look, this calculation of the, on, the, on the boyfriend's face, like, oh. And the girlfriend is kind of scared, like, maybe I said too much. Maybe he thinks I'm making a commitment, like, he, I'm getting ready to give him the ultimatum. Either you propose or I'm out of here. Uh, and so she kind of backtracks, kind of quiets herself down and kind of uh, takes back, like, oh, isn't it a beautiful starry night? Oh, look at over there. What kind of car is that, honey? And so she's trying to retract all the things that she was saying, thinking that, oh, I've scared him off. And so after the boyfriend drops her off at the house there, she runs up the stairs, gets on the phone and says, I think I've ruined it. I told, I told him that we were married. We were going out six months and he got this pain look in his face like, oh my gosh, that's way too long. I'm not going to be committed. And so, you know, she's going like that. And meanwhile, the guy goes home to his house. He goes to himself, opens up the door, heats up an old bowl of mac and cheese, sits down, watches a rerun of tennis. And he's like, and he picks up the phone and he calls the mechanic. He says, yeah, like this it's been six months since I've had an oil change. Uh, I was wondering if I could make an appointment, <laughs> you know? So the girlfriend says it's been six months and he's calculating like, oh, it's been six months since I've had my oil change. I should probably get, so it's just to say, Abraham and Lot, they separated, no problem. They're thinking this is a great resolution. But Sarah, <laughs> her, her heart was torn. She's calling her, she's calling her girlfriend. That kind of thing. Um, 
separation. She lived through separation. Okay, that's our first page of five. Well, really only four and a half. Okay, flip that one over. Okay, where was Sarah when God rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah and her son? Her son and her heart lived there. Um, interestingly, I say that Sarah is mentioned only four times in the scriptures, but I think uh, he's in mind when Hebrews writer says in chapter 13, entertain strangers, show hospitality to strangers, because in doing so, you may be entertaining angels unaware. Entertain strangers, because you may be entertaining angels unaware. It's a good reason to offer up hospitality to strangers, not just to your friends. Sarah did. She had three people come, and uh, Abraham, Abraham welcomes them, brings them in, and he runs into Sarah, and he says, Sarah, quick, make something for them to eat, he says. And, and obviously they weren't in a very big hurry because they had to go and kill the calf, and then once the calf was killed, they had to dress the calf, and then once that was done, then they had to cook the calf. So anyway, I don't know how big of a hurry it was, but she ends up baking them bread, and she ends up making a meal for them, entertaining. That story is juxtaposed against Lot's wife, who entertained angels, and it Lot found these men out on the square of Sodom in the wicked city, and he brings them home. It's not safe out here. And Lot's wife, like, oh, what a joke. This is so, it's just, there's this juxtaposition between how Sarah entertained these angels and how Lot's wife entertained these same angels. Like Lot's wife in the New Testament is thought of like this. Um, remember Lot's wife, period. What are we supposed to remember about her? How she looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. You could get Lot's wife out of Sodom, but you couldn't get Sodom out of Lot's wife. He hearkened back to it. She's like, oh, the good old days. She dearly didn't want to go. Anyway, all that to say, she entertained angels unaware, and I think when it says to, for us to entertain strangers that they had Sarah in mind there. Um, we also have the story of the Valley of Salt, where four kings from the north come down and descend on a, uh, the five kings of the south, Sodom and Gomorrah being one of them. And these four kings and their armies decimate the five kings of the south and take prisoners back to Damascus. And guess who one of the prisoners was? Lot. And so Sarah was probably awakened that night when one sole survivor came knocking on the door. And said, you, you gotta let me in, Abraham. You just don't know what happened. You know what happened? And, and it's like, this one guy survives. This, this four armies attacking five armies and coming out victorious. Very few survivors. And this one messenger says, who can I turn to? Who can we get help from? And he thinks to himself, I know. I'll, I'll go talk to that shepherd guy. You know, that shepherd that serves, what's his name, um has a wife named Sarah, the barren one. Um, <laughs> um, so he runs to Abraham's house, to, who's a shepherd, and he has 318 servants, which may seem like a lot if you just have a house to clean and a yard to mow. But when you're going to face four armies, 318 servants really doesn't sound like a lot. And yet that messenger said to himself, Who, where can I go to get help? I can get help from Abraham and the God that he serves. I'm going to go and run to Abraham. And so Sarah heard the knock and she received the news. Your son has been taken captive because the four kings from the north have defeated the five kings from the south. And so she had to hear that. And so Abraham's like, okay, round up my, round up my ran cans. You know, the one who cooks the grub for the farm. Bring him too. He'll be very, you know, like, who are these guys? They know how to brand cattle. What, you know, you just think, anyway. Um, so Abraham says, we're coming. We're going to, Sarah's like, Abraham, what are you going to do? What do you think is going to happen? You're going to go out and say a prayer? You Let the five, let someone else do it. And instead, she watches Abraham and his posse ride off into the sunset to go, so you go get Lot and seek justice from these four armies that have invaded and defeated five other armies. And so she had to wait. 
wait for his return? Is he going to make it home? Will he actually be able to do anything against the four armies and the four kings? What does Abraham know, know about fighting? He's down in Egypt afraid for his head. Sarah, Sarah, could, could, could you tell him that you're my sister? Maybe save my skin. And now here he is. What? What? And, uh, and so Sarah had to wait for these 318 to come back, uh, whether or not they're. So God gave the victory there. You can read about that. Um, um, also, <laughs> writing off with his posse. How many of us have, you know, like when Abraham gets the call, he says, I've got to get transferred to Shechem. I've got to get transferred to Gerar. I've got to get transferred to Bethel. Sarah follows them. And well, there's a lot of our friends that have actually had to go through that. And they've had to do it by faith. Um, where they lose a job and they go on to the next. They lose their friends and they go on to the next to follow their. So Sarah knew about that. And Sarah also knew what it was to send her husband off into battle. To send her husband off, as it were, as a police officer or as a first responder or as a soldier or maybe as a pastor or an elder or a deacon in the church that is going off to do battle for our souls and for our church. He knew what it was. What is he going to come back? Is he, is he going to come back? And what will be the news? Another time that he had to wait, uh, she had to wait is what about the offering up of Isaac? Well, I'm going to assume that she knew that what Abraham was up to, what he was called to do. Um, she's been with him. She's agreed to all his harebrained ideas in the past. And Abraham's thinking, I wonder if she'll agree to this one. Here we go. He, he, gives, it, he gives it a try. And Sarah's like, let me make the lunches. And they go a three-day journey, Abraham and Isaac and the men. They go a three-day journey. And Abraham finds Mount Moriah three days in. He raises his knife and is ready to plunge the knife into the heart of Isaac as a sacrifice. And the angel stays his hand. And within a nanosecond, he recognizes, my son is not going to die. I don't have to kill him. There is a substitute. It is Christ Jesus. No, it wasn't Christ Jesus. In that, in that story, it was the ram caught in a thicket. It was like our Christ Jesus that died in our place. And so Abraham's like, oh, I got to get out my cell phone and text my wife. She's going to be so excited. Oh, they didn't have cell phones. Like, honey, oh, Isaac, we better hurry home. And they hurry home one day, two days, three days in. This is a whole week that Sarah's waiting for the report. And she is, she is on pins and needles until she sees Abraham and her son of promise walking down the street right towards her. Seven days she waited for that. Baby. More than pins and needles for her, I'm sure. Um, so there she is waiting. We remember the patriarchs, but really the matriarchs should be remembered as well because you got to consider, um, as far as Peter is concerned, he says they are heirs together of the life of grace. They are heirs together. They're one of the life of grace, Peter calls them. Okay, okay, okay. Don't panic, Deborah. <clears throat> we looked at Hebrews chapter 11, where it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The thing, idea of bringing visible from the invisible. You could write that over the life of Sarah. Okay. In chapter 15. So what happens is we have those three chapters where Sarah is not mentioned at all, but in chapter 15, Abraham gets this covenant kind of deal with God. This, this vision or something weird is going on in chapter 15. You'll have to go through it, but it's where God makes a covenant with Abraham. And, and in that covenant, he says, I will make you a great nation. You're going to have a son. And, and it was one of those covenants that clearly was unilateral because Abraham was like in a comatose state. He couldn't really agree to anything. And so God just made it a covenant with himself. It's like God says, I'll sign for Abraham. And he makes this covenant and Abraham wakes up. He's all excited. He goes home and guess what? He's repeated it, Sarah. We are going to have a nation. We're going to create a nation. And they're all excited because they're laying in bed together and Abraham's telling him, her day his day and she's like oh okay yeah well, well i killed a you know she's going over her day i vacuumed and then i um did the dishes and then i did the laundry and then well this is what happened to me abraham says and so she hears this again and she's like you know what it's been 10 years since i've had a period 
I, I, I don't think there's any hope. This can't be about me. And so the next day, in chapter 16, as I read it, it's the next day after that bedtime talk, it says, and Sarah, who was barren, came up with a bright idea. I know, I'll give him Hagar. You can just imagine, she wakes up and she says, it's hopeless, it's, it's no use, it's not going to happen. She just wakes up in a fit of depression, a fit of just, it's a hot mess, and everything's spiraling out of control, and everything's, and she says, you ought to just take Hagar, my maid, and she can give you a servant, um, son. And he's like, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, that, that'll work. You know why? Let's just, it, it was to me, and you really are as good as that. Husbands. I, don't, I know there's no husbands listening to this tape, but don't um, give in to any of your wife's bright ideas when they're in a, spout, a bout of depression or a bout of, of melt, uh, in the middle of a meltdown or they're spiraling out of control. You say, let's sit on that for a week, honey, and see where this takes us, you know? Uh, and that's for us with our friends too. You're just like, let's, let's wait here before you sell your house and move to move off the grid. Let's sit on this for it. Cause we come up on um, my most, if I listen to some of the bright ideas I came up with when I was down in the mouth, well, we wouldn't be here today. That much we can say. <laughs> <laughs> and so Abraham should have made some hard decisions there. He like, like Sherry here was saying, Adam should have made some hard decisions. He should have ran interference between the talking serpent and Eve, but he did not. And Abraham listened to Sarah and went through with it. Women, we are influential. You look at the book of Esther and you have Haman's wife influencing her husband and you have Ahasuerus influencing her husband. Haman's wife eggs him on the whole time. I eggs them on all the way to the gallows. Yeah, you make Mordecai do that. You make him bow down. Yeah, you do it. And you ought to make the gallows as high as this. And, and lo and behold, she ended up costing her husband his life. Meanwhile, Hasheraris is about ready to run headlong over a cliff and, and, and destroy and decimate the apple of God's eye. And Hester says, hold up. Whoa, pull back. And he's like, thanks, Hester. You saved me from making a very grave mistake. And it's all because of the women. We have influence. Oh, then that a story in Genesis 18 is quite funny. When Abraham invites those three guys in, and he invites them in, tells Sarah, "Quick, make a meal." And and they're interestingly enough, Sarah's in the tent, and Abraham and the boys are are angels. Abraham and the boys are outside talking, and it's almost as if they're saying, "Well, where's Sarah at? Why isn't she in this conversation?" It's the same thing that happened to Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha's in the kitchen. And Martha's like, why isn't Mary where women belong? In the kitchen. And she's thinking, I've got all society on my side. I'm sure Jesus is on my side too. He goes into Jesus and says, Jesus, don't you care that Mary's not in the kitchen with me where women belong? And Jesus says, oh no, she's right where she belongs. And so these angels ask Abraham, where is Sarah? How come she's not out here? And Abraham says, well, someone's got to do the cooking. She's in the tent, kind of a thing. Well, they tell Abraham, you're going to have a son. And Sarah laughs. Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door. Oh, yeah, you can just imagine her ear press up to the tent door, which was behind them. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age. And Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Her, therefore, Sarah laughed within herself. Here's another half truth. When they said, you laughed, she's like, no, no, so, so there they are having a conversation, and, and the angels say, did you hear something? And Abraham, no. Oh, oh, no, I think Sarah laughed. And Abraham, no, she didn't. And Sarah's like, no, that's right, I didn't. Uh-uh. <laughs> it's like a half-truth. I didn't laugh out loud. That doesn't make it a laugh. And they're like, oh, yes, you did. Um, uh, he said, after I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. And it's almost as if the angel said to her, you know what your problem is, Sarah? You're looking at the wrong Lord. Is any two thing too great for the Lord? A year from now, we'll be back and you will have a son. And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh saying, shall I surely bear a child since I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied, I, I, I didn't say, I, I didn't laugh, not me. 
it's like, I can't blame her. I'd do the same thing too. Unless you've got some hard physical evidence that's going to hold up in a court of law. You didn't record it. It didn't happen. So Sarah's hanging on that. And he said, surely you did laugh. And then in 21, we see, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son, Laughter. God has made me laugh, said Sarah, and all who are with me will laugh also. It's that kind of contagious laugh. My uncle Bobby had a laugh that it could have been the corniest joke around. He could have been in the middle of trying to tell the joke, but he starts to get in a fit of laughter and everybody's rolling on the floor with him and nobody has a clue what the punchline is. <laughs> and so she says, this is the kind of contagious laugh that Isaac and God keeping his promises can do. So we can live that kind of contagious life, that kind of God loves happy endings. And, that, and he has that in mind for us. Um, yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay well, well, Abraham didn't have the bitter. When when Sarah laughed, she was kind of in a bitter, hard laugh. In the chapter before, God tells Abraham, "You're going to have a son." He's like, "Yeah, I can't wait. I got a boy on the way." And Aaron's like, "Sarah's like, yeah, right. Like that's ever going to happen." The scriptures are very mindful to point out that Sarah's laugh was one of incredulity and unbelief. Um, and that's, the, that's what makes First Peter all the more shocking, that they're using that phraseology that she used as an example. It's like, wow, even in the midst of unbelief, they're holding her up. Even in the midst of our unbelief, God can use us. So if her laughter had been like that of Abraham, I'm sure it would have gone well for her. Yeah, right. Like it was in chapter 21. So <clears throat> we'll, we'll bring this to a close. Um, there's a lot more you can say about Sarah. God, God accepts us right where we are. Even in her laughter, God didn't say, I'll find someone else. He didn't give up. So let's pray. <clears throat> Precious God, we do not like waiting. We don't like waiting at DMV. We don't like waiting at the drive-thru. We don't like waiting for packages to deliver. We don't like waiting for people who show up late for coffee meetings. And yet you even say in 1 Corinthians 11.33, Wait for one another. That's how we can show we love one another, is by simply waiting. And so even in our frustration, we look to you and think, oh, the long-suffering patience of our God. How long you've been waiting for us to come around to your way of thinking, to seeing things through your eyes, to prioritizing and valuing lives around us the same way you do. You give us a directive and I, this is what I do anyway, I sit there and calculate, is this a good choice? Is this really a good plan? I don't know, God, have you considered alternative plan B? And yet you patiently wait until we come around. Lord, I pray that you would work that same long-suffering, joyful patience in us. Joyful patience. Not just suffering long, I'm going to put up with you, but to kind of like, I'll gladly wait. Take your time. Do what you need. I will be here. We think of how Hosea does that, how he gladly waited for Gomer. And so, Lord, we pray, work that in us, that we can bear patiently with circumstances, that we can bear patiently with other people around us, and that really we can even bear patiently as we deem it with you and your timing. You do all things well. We confess it to be so. We look at how our own do-it-yourself projects and, and we just pray, Lord, protect us from our own do-it-yourself. Protect us from going our own way. Help us to hear your heart only, that we would press in, put our head upon your breast, our ears, hearing your very heart, say, where you lead, that's where I want to go. I don't want to go to the right or to the left. Show me your way, O oh Lord, and I will walk in it. That's what we desire to pray. Lead us by thy Holy Spirit. Thank you for Sarah. Thank you for making her so much like us that we can relate to her on every point. As we study Hannah this week, have it be so that we can learn more of ourselves and more of you in it as we do our homework. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom we have here. May we take advantage of it. Take it, not take it for granted, but utilize it to know you more. We love you, Lord Jesus, and thank you for sending your great son for us and paying our price. Amen. <clears throat>